According to the best and the latest statistics that I could find, the average American citizen now has a life expectancy of between 78 and 79 years. That's not too bad, huh? And more and more employees feel that the appropriate retirement age is now 70. It's no longer 65. You've got to make it to 70 now. So despite living longer and working longer and making better wages, the average American citizen still dies with over $60,000 worth of debt attached to their name. Did you know that? Friends, we're living longer, we're working longer, and yet we're still dying with debt. Isn't that a sad scenario? Aren't you trying to work hard now so that you don't have debt when you're 78 and 79 years old? Right? But it seems that that's not the way it is. Lurking, working longer, we're working harder, we're making better wages, still dying in debt. Is it any wonder then that many people feel trapped and enslaved to their jobs? In a fitting comparison of the old adage coined by the seven dwarfs in the movie Snow White, a man once said our attitudes are no longer hi-ho, but I owe, I owe. <laughs> so off to work we go. Brethren, let's do our best to master the money before the money masters us. We're continuing our series on adversity, and tonight we're going to talk about the despondency of debt. Three things we want to suggest, and here's the first one. In the first place, let's talk about the results of financial debt. Two things stick out, and here's the first one. Stress. Stress is pressure or strain upon the mind. It is something that causes bodily or mental tension. Recent studies indicate that up to 85% of Americans have experienced stress related to their finances. And around 30% admit to feeling constantly stressed about money. Is that who we are? Are we part of the 85? Are we part of the 30? Are we constantly stressed out regarding money? It doesn't have to be that way. Money can be spent more quickly than we can make it. Have you figured that out yet? Have you figured that out yet? We can spend more than we can ever bring in. The solution, brethren, is contentment. Turn with me to the book of Joy. Do you know what that is by now? Preacher stands up here and starts talking about something written in the book of Joy. Where are you going? You're going to Philippians, right? You're going to the book of Philippians. Let's look at Philippians 4, beginning in verse 11. Then we'll look at something written in 1 Timothy. But look with me at 1 Timothy, or rather the book of Philippians, the book of Joy, Philippians 4 and verse 11. Philippians 4.11, the inspired Apostle Paul writes, Not that I speak in respect of want. I don't know if you mark in your Bible, but you might want to underline this, box it, highlight it, whatever it is. For I have, what? Learned. Do you see that contentment is learned behavior? Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am, therewith to be what? Content. How are we going to be content? We got to learn. How are we going to learn? We got to learn from the scriptures. Go with me to 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 6. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Let's observe verses 6 through 8. Are we putting forth the effort to learn contentment when it comes to our finances and to money? If not, we're going to be in trouble. 1 Timothy 6, beginning in verse 6, but godliness with what? Godliness with contentment is what? Is great gain. Why is that? When you see the word for, say why. Why is that? For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain that we can, that, or rather, it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment. Raiment is Bible language in the King James Version, basically for clothing. Suitable, adequate clothing. Having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Do we see that contentment is learned behavior? Are we putting forth the effort to learn contentment regarding money and finances? Money is necessary to navigate through this life, but it will pass away. Read 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Now, do we believe what the Bible teaches? 
We of all people need to believe what the Bible teaches. If we're not content regarding possessions and finances, why is that? We haven't learned. We haven't learned what God wants us to learn from the scriptures. So what's the first result of financial debt? Stress. What's the second one? Anger. Anger. Who hasn't felt like kicking themselves over useless, pointless, silly purchases? I'd stand up here and say, I've never felt that way, but that'd be a lie. That would be a lie. I think most people who have lived long enough and brought in enough money, whatever it may be, surely we've all bought something that we look back and go, why did I buy that? What did we need that for? So as far as that goes, probably all of us are in the same boat regarding those things. Perhaps everyone has bought something in the heat of the moment and later realized it wasn't worth what it cost. Dwelling on such things results in what? Frustration and anger. We can all kick ourselves over the boat that we should have never bought but bought anyway. Right? Whatever it is. Car, you name it. It could be a major purchase. It could be a whole lot of small purchases. Either way. Anger always affects others. Did you know that money and finances are now one of the leading reasons people get divorced? Did you know that? Now, the Bible hadn't changed. Except it be for fornication and marry another committeth adultery. The Bible, Jesus hadn't changed. But now what's happening is people are getting married, perhaps at a young age. They see all the nice things that their parents had to work 30 and 40 and 50 years to get, and they want to start off right out of the gate like mom and dad and grandma and grandpa are in the twilight, so to speak, of life. It doesn't work that way. Now, you can go get whatever you want on credit. You can go, get, you can go sign your name to whatever you want. And the banks or whoever will turn you loose with just about anything. Let you pay X amount for, you know, basically the rest of your life. But is that wise? Is that the scriptural principle that God wants us to follow? Indeed, it is not because unrealistic expectations cause frustration, even in the marriage. Go to me the book of Ephesians. Let's look at one of the more practical aspects or practical chapters of the Bible, and that, my judgment, would be Ephesians chapter 4. And let's see what the Bible teaches in Ephesians 4, 26 and 27. Where does anger in our lives? Do we get upset over our finances? Do we take it out on our spouses or on our children? Because it will affect others. Ephesians 4, 26, be ye angry and sin not. Is that what the Bible teaches? That's what the Bible teaches. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath, neither give place to the devil. Anger has a place in our lives. But we can be angry and we are still not to sin. You understand that? Read Mark chapter 3 and you'll see that Jesus got angry. He cleared the temple at the beginning and the ending of his ministry. He was not happy. You understand? But we can't become angry over our finances and then become bitter and take it out on our families. Look at me in the book of Colossians. Look at Colossians 3 and verse number 8. This is somewhat parallel. What are we talking about? We're talking about the results of financial debt, stress and anger. Is it worth it? No. Colossians 3, 8, but now ye also put off. You know, you'll see in these contexts, there are some things we're to put off and there are some things we're to put on, right? Here's an example of some things we need to separate. We need to get this out of our lives. But now ye also put off all these. What's at the top of the list? In this context, it says anger in the King James Version, doesn't it? Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of whose mouth? Out of your mouth. That's what we can control. So what are the results of financial debt? Two easy ones that we can see. Stress and anger. Not worth it. Let's move on. In the second place, let's talk about the root of financial debt. The root of financial debt. We want to suggest two things, just like we did. And here's the first one. It's ignorance. What's the root of financial debt? It's ignorance. Perhaps we've not done an effective job teaching our children how much it costs to live. You know how much the clothes on your back cost? The shoes on your feet? That stuff, that doesn't just float down out of the sky. At my house, I don't, is that the way it is at your house? Does it just float down out of the sky? If so, tell me how, what I need to do to get it to float down out of the sky. But it doesn't, does it? No. Most parents, with good intentions, probably attempt to shield their children from financial, or that is from family financial struggles, and the day-to-day -day grind of making ends meet 
But does that really equip them for life? Does that really equip our children for life? Do you know how much gas is? Do you know how much money it costs? You all know. But do our children have these concepts in their mind? How much does it cost to fill up a vehicle? How far can you go on a full tank of gas? It does not go quite as far as you think it goes, does it? We know this. But are we passing this wisdom along to our children so that they'll appreciate the things that they have? Well, we're trying. Teenagers and young adults who are used to mommy and daddy footing all their debts will, write it down, will sooner or later hit major roadblocks in life. What do you mean? Most entry-level jobs do not pay anywhere close to the combined income of two experienced working adults. They see what mom and dad have worked 35, 40 years to achieve, and mom and dad are making 35, 40 years worth of experience pay, and here Junior is, straight out of school, thinking he's going to live like that. Does he know how much it costs, or she? Do they understand how much it costs to keep that standard of living up? Have we, have we kept our children up to date to say, look son, look daughter, do you know how much a tank of gas is? Do you realize? How much do you think you're going to make an hour? See how many hours you have to work to fill up the car once. And you'll burn it out going back and forth here and there. Listen, it's, we need to teach our children these things. Will their earned income ever be able to match their standard of living? What do you mean? Mommy and daddy set their standard of living here. Entry-level job pay is here. There's a problem. Who's filling in that gap? Who's filling in the gap? You want me to answer it? Mommy and daddy. Mommy and daddy forever. That can't be. We need to teach our children how much it costs to live. What are we talking about? The root of financial debt. Some mommies and daddies say, look, no. I'm not going to fill in the gap. You go live off your income, and they don't have a clue how to do it. They don't know. Now, we need to teach the truth about everything. Go with me back to the Old Testament book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs is the book of wisdom. Wisdom is the correct and practical application of knowledge. Let's look in Proverbs 13. We'll notice three verses within this chapter. Let's begin at Proverbs 13 and verse number 4. Proverbs 13, 4 in the King James Version says, The soul of the sluggard, that is the lazy, desireth and hath nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made fat. Perhaps the idea there is rich or wealthy. Now, look in the same chapter, but verse 11. Wealth gotten by vanity. The idea perhaps could be dishonesty or even by other means. Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. It takes time to be able to accumulate nicer things in life. And there's no shame in that. No shame in it. But it's not going to necessarily be like you've been working for 40 years when you get your first job. Probably not going to be that way. Look at verse 18. Same chapter. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction. What are we trying to do? We're trying to educate everyone about finances and godly living. Poverty and shame shall be to him that refuseth instruction, but he that regardeth reproof shall be honored. Now, what's the root of financial debt? Well, one of them is ignorance, but the second one could be even worse, and that is covetousness. What's the root of financial debt? Ignorance, we just don't know, but then covetousness. A simple yet accurate definition of covetousness is the greedy desire for more. Some people never have enough of whatever they set their mind upon. So we ask, how much of whatever it is we desire will make us content? What do you desire? Let's say you desire land. How much land are you going to have to have before you say, you know what, boys, i got enough land. You desire houses? How many houses are you going to have to have before you say, you know what, i got enough houses. What if it's gold coins? Say, how, how many gold coins can a person actually own? I don't know. How many, would, how many gold coins, guns, pick, pick it, whatever it is. How many of whatever it is we desire would we get to where we say, I'm good? That, 
changes from person to person, doesn't it? That's an individual question that we have to answer as individuals, and we need to ask it of ourselves as individuals. Well, the covetous man, you know what his answer will be? You ask the covetous man, say he's a land lover. He likes to own property. How much land will it take for you to be content? You know what the covetous man will say? Just a little more. Just a little more. You already got 100 pieces of property. How many more do you need? Just a little more. You already got 100 houses. How many more do you need? Just a few more. No matter what it is. How many guns do you have? That's two-thirds of my house or gun cabinets, for example. How many more guns do you need? Just a few more. Just a little more and I'll be content. Understand, it doesn't matter really what it is. As we will see, the Bible is plain in its condemnation of covetousness. But can we recognize covetousness within ourselves? Can we recognize covetousness within ourselves or in our loved ones? That's a tough question, isn't it? We can generally look up and see the, the wealthy men say, oh, look at all this they have. They're just greedy. They're just covetous. Well, we may not have as much money as them, but we may just be just as covetous if we're not careful. Is that so? That's Bible. Go with me back to the book of Colossians. Let's look at Colossians 3 and this time in verse number 5. Let's lay out a very simple principle that perhaps we've forgotten. What is covetousness really? Well, it's the greedy desire for more. How does God feel about it? Colossians 3.5 gives us a pretty good idea. Colossians 3.5 and the King James says, Mortify, kill it, put it to death. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, that which is not influenced by the Spirit of God through the Scripture. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence. Now look at this. We know, you hear those words and go, oh man, that's awful. I don't even know what all those things mean, so to speak, but they sound awful, don't they? Well, we can understand this one. And covetousness, and how does God feel about covetousness? Which is idolatry. Idolatry. The greedy desire, generally speaking, for more possessions, what is it in God's eyes? It's essentially idolatry. We're knocking God off the pedestal and putting possessions there, whatever they may be. That's wrong. Back up to Ephesians. Look at Ephesians 5 and verse 5. Here's the sad part of being Guilty of the sin of covetousness, as if being guilty of idolatry is not bad enough. Perhaps Ephesians 5 and verse 5 puts it in plain enough language where we can get it. Ephesians 5, 5 says, For this ye know, you know this is the case, that no whoremonger, you understand what that is, nor unclean person, you probably understand the general idea of that, nor covetous man, now surely you can understand that, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Meaning what? If we live and die in the sin of covetousness, we're not going to heaven. Now is that plain? How much plainer could God state it in the Bible before we say, hmm, what's the problem? We understand what the Bible says. We, in essence, understand what the Bible means. But do our lives look like this? Do we conduct ourselves and live our lives like covetous individuals? That's a hard question, isn't it? Well, what's the root of financial debt? Two things, ignorance and covetousness. But let's move on. In the third place, let's try to get some positive things. Let's try to be nice. Let's talk about the remedy for financial debt. Two things we want to suggest. One is very practical. The other one is scriptural, so, and they both come from the Bible. But what's the remedy for financial debt? Here's a very practical suggestion, and it is this word, budget. Budget. Let me provide a simple and effective principle learned from a non-Christian friend several years ago. You won't forget this, because I didn't. Here's the principle. Watch. Work, money, buy. B-U-I. That's it. That's it. You want to avoid debt? Watch the watch. It's simple. Get up and go to work. Work an honest job. What do they do when you work an honest job? They give you money, don't they? Check, cash, whatever it is. Then what do you do? You get up, you go to work, you get money, then you buy. B U Y. You go purchase what you need to purchase. Mess with that. Think about it. Work, money, buy. Now, you want me to tell you what we do? We buy. Then we realize, I got to go to work and get money. 
Right? Isn't that what we do? We go buy it now and say, I'll pay for it later. Well, wait a minute. What's the principle? Work, money, buy. What do we do? Buy, then get up and say, I owe, I owe. It's off to work we go. Think about it, brethren. Now, that's, that's kind of silly and it's kind of lighthearted, but it's true, isn't it? Isn't it true? Work, money, buy. You stick with that, you're good to go. You buy and then think I'm going to go work to get the money to pay it off. You might, but you'll pay interest. Have you, have you tasted the depths of interest yet? Hmm? You, don't want, you don't want to taste interest. You don't, you don't like the taste of interest. You say, Brock, I don't even know what you're talking about. Good. You don't want to taste interest. It tastes bad all the way around. You'll figure out what that means if you ever pay it. Now, we might be able to keep it up for a while. That is, buy, money, work. But sooner or later, watch, we will spend more than we bring in, and the despondency of debt begins. Brethren, have we forgotten that we are stewards, and we are stewards of God's property? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 4. A simple principle is laid out, but it's true. And this is what we need to remind ourselves. We are stewards of God's property. God has blessed us with the ability to get up and go to work and maintain a good job. This is his world. We're living in it. We're stewards of the things he has given us. 1 Corinthians 4.1, let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, look at this general principle. It is required. It is mandatory. It is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Well, what if we've not been faithful with the Lord's money? What if we've not been faithful with the blessings given to us by the Lord? Have we been a good steward? Have we been a good keeper of God's property? I think we understand the answer to that, don't we? Perhaps we should ask ourselves this question beforehand. How does God want me to spend his money? Do we ask ourselves that? How does God want me, the individual, to spend his money, because it is his money, isn't it? It's his. Or perhaps we could ask this, will what I'm about to buy help or hinder my family? How is this purchase, this possession, whatever it is? I understand we got to go to the grocery store and we got to buy clothes, I understand that. But there are other things that we splurge on, right? How will this help my family or will this hinder my family? And perhaps this would be the most difficult question to ask of all. Will this purchase bring glory to God? How will this purchase enable me to give God the glory by it? You know, but you know the problem? Sometimes we don't even ask that question, do we? We don't even think that far ahead. We, we, we act impulsively. We just get whatever we want whenever we get it. And I'm not saying that's inherently wrong. But you do enough of those, we're in trouble. Right? We're in big trouble. What's the remedy for financial debt? It's budget, but really the remedy is this word, and it is give. In Acts 20 and verse 35, Paul quoted Jesus as saying, it is more blessed. That's a comparison. It is more blessed to, he didn't say receive than give. That's not what he said. He said, quoting Jesus, it is more blessed to give than to receive. The verse in its context, that is Acts 20 verse 35, has reference to the positive things associated with the gospel. Preaching, teaching, and working hard at an honest job so that we will have to give to those in need. That's Bible language found in Ephesians 4 and verse 28. Some Christians feel as though it is as it is not their duty to give. Meaning that brother so-and-so will handle all the giving. Where did you read that? Where did you see that? Hey, what brother so-and-so gives is between brother so-and-so and the Lord. What my family gives is between us and the Lord. Let, let them do whatever they do. That's on them. Has God blessed me and my family? Then we need to give. Has God blessed you and your family? Then what's the answer? You need to give. To what end? Once we start comparing ourselves amongst ourselves, trouble awaits. Give. That's the Bible doctrine. Now, recall, brethren, it is God's money. 
So in essence, what are we doing? We're giving back to God what he first gave to us. Is it so difficult to give something back to the one who blessed us in the first place? Let's consider two passages. One's from the Old Testament. Book of Proverbs, Proverbs 3 this time. What's the remedy for financial debt? Give. Give to the Lord. You're not giving to me and you're not giving to the elders. You give to the Lord because that's what the Bible teaches. Proverbs 3 verse 9 says, Honor the Lord with thy substance. It doesn't say your neighbor's substance. You don't have to, don't have to give of anybody else's substance. You give of your own. What God has blessed you with. Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty. God will take care of those who do what he says to do. Do you believe that? What does this passage teach? I understand it's Old Testament, but what does it teach? Give. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. Look with me in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Everybody in here probably understands this passage. You've heard it all your life probably, but look at what Matthew 6, 19 through 21 actually says. You hear it quoted many times, but occasionally it does us pretty good to stop, turn to it, look at it, and read it. Look at Matthew 6, beginning in verse 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. How much plainer could Jesus say it? Why do you think the man said it? You think he just didn't have anything better to say? He understood we're going to struggle with these things, aren't we? So he's telling us in essence right here, he's not teaching us to be absolutely poverty stricken, but he's saying we cannot have this world to be the stop all end all. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But in contrast to that, lay up for yourselves. Watch this. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Now, why would Jesus say that? For. When you see for, say why. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. I read ahead, didn't you? Second Peter chapter 3 makes it clear everything we see is going to be burned up. It's not going to last. So if I've set up my treasure here, ultimately what's going to happen to it? If the moth and the rust doesn't get it first, the second coming of Christ is gone. It's gone. But we can lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven where it's not going to grow old. It's not going to fade away. And it's sure not going to burn up. The abundant life of John 10.10 10 is one free from the despondency of debt. Brethren, it's this simple. Either we rule the money or the money rules us. Where are we today? Are we ruling our finances or are our finances ruling us? The Bible provides us with financial principles which will keep us debt free, but we have to obey them. And we have to avoid this adver adversity in life by obeying what the Bible teaches first off. Even if we have made a mess of our finances, we can get out of debt, can't we? Some of us in life have perhaps made terrible financial decisions and we've been in the despondency of debt, but with the Lord's help and diligence, we've worked ourselves out of that. Well, let me tell you something that perhaps many people don't realize, but it's more true than financial debt. We owe a sin debt. And that sin debt, no matter what we do on our own, we cannot pay it. But thanks be to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he has paid that sin debt, but he has given us conditions which we must meet if we want our sin debt paid. Do you want your sin debt paid? Well, of course you do. Well, what must I do to be saved? You've got to hear the truth. Acts 18.8. Believe the truth. Acts 16.31. Repent of sin, Acts 17.30. Confess openly and freely that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Acts 8.37. You must be immersed in water for the remission of sins so that the blood of Jesus Christ will wash away all your past sins and you'll be raised up to walk in newness of life, Acts 2.38, Romans 6.3-5. But you may say, what happens once a Christian sins? 
Acts 8, 22. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. Wherever you are, come forward now as together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement. Oh.